Martin Lipsitz, the political man that sold about 700,000 copies, but it did that over 40 years. Uh, or Barrington Moore's Social Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy. But again, several hundred thousand copies. It was printed in 66. By now, that's how many it is. So for this book to sell uh, 1.5 million copies. Now, I will say this. Uh, that's how many it sold. But I don't think everybody read the whole thing. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we know they didn't. A lot of people didn't. Because the Wall Street Journal, which of course hates the book, because it's uh, it doesn't follow their line. So they have a total, you know, if you have a rise of the top 1%, that's because those people uh, uh, deserve that money because of their marginal productivity. Markets work. That's how they would explain it. I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, so they, they, they did a readership survey uh, and found that this book was the, was the book that people most often did not finish. Uh, and so, uh, like I say, uh, uh, you don't have to read the whole thing to actually understand what the book's arguing, but you do have to read a lot of it. Um, I had to read the whole thing. I agreed to review it for a, a journal before I knew how long it was. And so then I had to read it, so uh, I did. And, um, so this last semester when I was on leave, Evelyn and I and uh, Jing Jing Huo, who was a, uh, uh, a graduate student here and is now a, uh, a professor at Waterloo in Canada, uh, JJ and Evelyn and I uh, worked on an analysis of the data, uh, the World Top Incomes Database, which is a big, huge database that was assembled by Thomas Piketty um, Facundo Alvarado, Anthony Atkinson, and, and Emmanuel says, and they started assembling this, this database late, late 1990s, and it's all online, you can, uh, 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 and it's available for analysis, and it's partly this database that made it so well known that the top 1% of, um, uh, income earners in the United States was uh, here is the data on top income earners and you can see the United States we start off there um, in 1970 the top 1% gets um, 7.8% of national income. By 2012, this has risen to 18.9%. Um, in this period, all of the benefits of the economic growth occur, uh, accrue to the top decile of income earners in the United States. Nobody else got any better off. And the top 1% got the lion's share of what the top 10% got. Okay, so this is a huge concentration of income. Uh, and you can see, we're the most extreme, but among this group of countries, we're not, uh, we're, we're not alone. It's, it's a process that's happened in a, number, uh, in a number of countries. Now, this data right here does not have capital gains in it. So it has capital income. It has interest income, rents, all kinds of income. But capital gains, that's where you buy, say, some stock and then you sell it and the difference between the sales price and the buying price that's a capital gain now the next slide I'm going to show you actually includes capital gains uh, but you'll see it has well it has all the countries that we have that data for and it's not very many this data right here uh, we have for 18 18 rich capitalist democracies okay but the data I'm going to show you on the next slide, we only have for a few countries, and so you can't really analyze the data because you don't have enough countries. Um, and you can see now you have an even larger rise from 8.8% in 70 to 22.8%. Um, now, you'll, if, we, if I went back and forth, you would see 
this this bond uh, fluctuates more. And the reason it fluctuates more is that it, it includes capital gains, therefore it includes, uh, uh, it, it, it is magnified by swings in the stock market. So that's really what those up and down lines are, is basically swings in the stock market. It would look much smoother if it was just uh, labor income. Okay, now back to the book. <laughs> uh, what the book wants to do is it wants to, it's called capital in the 21st century, but it's really about capital in the 20th century, and so, to a certain extent in the 17th and 18th century, but uh, uh, you know, the data doesn't go very far into the 21st century. And he, does, he does extrapolate and, want, uh, and wants you to believe it's telling you something about the future. Now, he's gonna do three things in this book, three aspects of income distribution that he wants to examine. The first one is the ratio of total wealth in the country to national income. So how many times national income is the total wealth stock in the country? Then the second thing he wants to do is labor, labor and capital shares of national income. So national income can, can be divided into the shares going to capital and the shares going to labor. And the third thing he wants to do is explain the, uh, uh, the distribution of income by households. So that data that I showed you in the first two slides, that is distribution of income by households. That's what the top 1% of households gets of national income. Okay, that's really the usual way people look at income distribution, and that's what we think is the most important, is to look at it by household. Because of course, it's only at the household level that you can talk about things like poverty. Individual people aren't poor, households are poor. So a, a woman that's married to a CEO has no income, but we don't think of her as poor, even though she has no income. We think of a household as being the relevant unit for studying income distribution. And that's why those first two slides with household, with the distribution of household income is, is really ultimately the most important thing of these, three, of these three things. So first, the ratio of wealth to um, uh, 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 to national income, that's what he does first. And then he goes over to labor shares, doesn't spend a lot of time on labor shares, and then spends a lot of time on what the top 1% top is, is getting. And it's a, a big thing that he does in looking at the top 1% is decompose it. So he shows that if you look in 1900, the top 1% is almost all capital income. And by 2010, a whole lot of what the top 1% is getting is, um, is, uh, is, is labor income, okay? So what are these people? Well, to get into the top 1% in the United States, you have to earn, at the end of this time series, the household has to have over $375,000 in income, okay? So these are, these are managers, super, as he describes them, super managers. And that he says that's a, 20, a 20th century phenomenon, the growth of these super managers. So in the 19th, late 19th century, if you were getting in the top 1%, you were doing it because you owned a lot of something, right? In the 20th century, that starts to change and you get much more people in this top um, group that are, that are super managers. But anyway, the first thing he wants to look at is uh, uh, the, this ratio of the total wealth in society to national income. And he calls this ratio beta. Uh, and he shows that this ratio of uh, K to, to Y, that is of uh, wealth to national income, beta, it starts at 700%, pretty stable throughout the 19th century. So yes, data goes way back for for some of the countries like France and the UK, it's data back into the 17th century. Fairly stable at 700%, so wealth is seven times what uh, national income is in a given year. Uh, and it falls to 
300%, and now it's got back, it's back up to 600%. And he and Suckman, in an article that presents this data, call, uh, uh, refer to the work return of capital. And he talks about this U-shaped curve that, um, that, 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 this follow, that this follows. Uh, <coughs> okay, in the new world, he says you also get a U-shaped curve. But in the 19th century, you didn't have nearly as much concentration of wealth as you did in Europe. You were talking about 500%, uh, but not as big a decline in the 20th century. Okay, so what's his explanation? I'm gonna give you a lot of figures and definitions here. And you don't have to try to remember this stuff. You just have to get the gist of what the main argument is. Uh, okay, so he defines R as a rate of return on capital. G is a real growth rate, and that includes population growth. So it's not just uh, per capita income growth, it's population growth also. So now, when we don't have any population growth in these societies, it's growth of per capita income because we don't, almost none of these countries are, are growing much in terms of population except to the extent that they have in migration, which is, you might have noticed recently, it was fairly large in Europe. But, uh, anyway, and then uh, S is the savings rate, and alpha is the capital share of national income. And as I said, there's just two shares. so. By definition, the labor share is one minus alpha, okay? Uh, then he says alpha is going to equal R times um, beta, which I just defined on the previous page, and that's the ratio of national, of, of total wealth in the country to national income. Okay, he calls this the first law, of fundamental, the first fundamental law of capitalism. It's not really a law. It's an identity. In other words, it's true by definition. He says that's what it is and, uh, uh, and asserts it. So, uh, so, for example, if beta was 600%, so it was six times, so wealth is six times national income, uh, rate of return is 5%, then alpha, uh, the, the capital share, is. Um, is going to be 30 percent. And now he has something else which he calls beta. He, again, he goes back to beta, but this time he says, remember before it was it was equal to k, the ratio of k to y, right? And now he's saying it is equal to um, the savings rate divided by the growth rate. Now, for that to work, it's only going to work over the long run. For this to work, it's, if you just did the math, you would find out that then the savings rate and R, the rate of return on capital, have to be the same. Now, in the very long run, this might be close to true because wealthy people just cannot, the kind of people we're talking about, we were talking about the people that, that the Kennedy is talking about, cannot consume you know, there's a certain limit to how much you can consume. So even if we look at the uh, ridiculously uh, extravagant lifestyle of Donald Trump, he's still only consuming a small portion of what his returns are, okay? So Piketty says, for that to work out, uh, is uh, you're gonna have to have that identity. Um, so then he says, so for example, to go back to the examples, it still fit that one I had before. If S equals 12 and G equals two, then beta will be 600%. And then he says that beta does measure the overall importance of capital in society, so analyzing this ratio is a necessary first step, step in the study of inequality. And that's the way it is in the book. It's in the beginning of the book. That's the first thing that he does. Um, and then he says they're related to the other dimensions of inequality. Uh, one of the dimensions is the labor capital share, which is alpha, okay? 
And you can see that's going to have to be true, uh, uh, given the stuff that he set up. And it is true that if in our data set, which covers 60 to 2012, if I if I correlate top top one percent income, I'm sorry, the labor share or capital share of national income, it is correlated 0.6 something to uh, uh, beta. Okay, so the ratio of capital to income. All right, now let's look at his explanation for the U curve because what we want to get here, if possible, is a possible explanation for what we started off with at the very beginning. As Americans or whatever, you want, you know, we want to know why this is. Why is it that um, the income of the top 1% more than doubles in the United States and, no, and the average household does not get better off at all from 70 to the present? That's obviously politically important to know that. Okay. Okay, so let's go to his explanation. Uh, his numbers aren't arbitrary. He shows that over the long haul, growth rate has normally been one to one and a half percent in the period 1700 to 2012. And then he shows in France and the UK from the 18th to the 21st century, R, the rate of return, is uh, Four to five percent. No, no, I left one thing out. I left the inequality out. I should. Oh no, I did. I just skipped over it. Okay, so if R is greater than G, B is going to increase. Okay, and you can see that's clear. Uh, R is greater than G. Now that this inequality that's in red here, he repeats throughout the book. If R is greater than G. Uh, B will increase. So the importance of the wealth, and then he says inherited wealth, is going to become more important. So what he's going to claim is that it became much less important, or he shows, he's not going to just claim it, he's going to show it became much less important, and now it's coming back, and this uh, has the danger that we will get see the recreation of a, a Belle Epoque, uh, Gilded Age, uh, patrimonial class, and that's what he's that's what he says is coming in the future, right? A class in which inherited wealth is really important. Okay, so as B increases, the importance of inherited wealth for income distribution increases. Okay, so I said numbers aren't arbitrary. So uh, if we uh, Okay, the, the, the growth rate, and what we would call, that's a French term for that period of 75 to, of 45 to 75, we call it uh, in English literature, mainly the, the golden age of post-war capitalism, of 3.8% per year in Europe and 2.8% per year in, uh, in the United States is very much the exception. So for a long time after the end of this period of growth in the 70s, Economists and political economists were saying, okay, why do we have slower growth now? That's not what they should have asked. They should have asked, why did we have faster growth in that one period there? That's the deviant period. We never had growth that fast in the 19th and early 20th century. Okay, so how do we explain this disappearance of capital? Given we have this natural tendency, well, R is greater than G, so capital is going to concentrate, then how is it that that didn't happen? in this period, uh, and here's his explanation. He says part of it is because of this exceptional period right after the war, okay, of fast growth. But is mainly due to the two world wars and the depression. In both world wars, we had massive destruction of capital, and then of course in the depression, uh, massive bankruptcies. Also during those wars and during the Depression, we had low savings rates in all of these countries. Uh, and finally, 
We in almost all these countries, we levied really high marginal taxes on the order of 80% on top incomes. And he says that's those those are the things that did it. They destroyed basically destroyed capital. So he's basically saying a B of 600% is normal, and so we've seen a return of capital, and that is likely to continue into the future. Okay. So then he wants to tell you that this is going to explain why labor shares look the same way. So that, or capital shares, they dropped as a percentage of national income, and then they start to go back up. And that's true. And the correlation between the two is not super high, it's hardly an identity, but it's high enough so that we could expect capital shares to keep increasing if, if beta keeps increasing. But the correlation between beta and top 1% income shares is only 0.16. It's not very high at all. And our puzzle there is why isn't it very high? Well, it's something I already alluded to. In France, in the UK, and in the United States, a lot of these, but especially in the United States and the UK, a lot of these top income earners are managers. They're CEOs of big corporations. Like I said, in the United States, we're talking on the order of a household income of, 300, of at least $375,000. And of course, it goes way up from there. So a lot of these people are these CEOs that earn millions in annual compensation. So the, those are counted in income distribution by capital and labor shares. They're counted as labor shares. So these salaries can go way up, and labor shares uh, capital shares are not going to go way up in a corresponding way. So it, this is possible. What I'm saying is it's possible. No, I'm not just saying it's possible. I'm saying that's what it is, right? So we start off the book and we think we're going to get an explanation of the ph phenomenon back here that everybody thinks is so politically important, right? I mean, this is kind of why I mean, Obama's talking about it. Uh, obviously, Bernie Sanders is talking about it. But people on the other side are also worried about it. And, uh, and like, it's really, you used to, if you, it used to be before recently, if you just talked about, about inequality per se as being a problem. I don't mean poverty. I'm talking about inequality per se. People would say, oh, you, you, you're waging class warfare. And now, all the Democrats are talking about it, right? And uh, Hillary Clinton is talking about it. Well, that's why. Okay. So that's what we want to know why this happened. Okay. So that's what Evelyn and I decided to do. Evelyn and I and, and uh, JJ. Uh, so we got the data from his top incomes database and combined it with a, uh, a, a, data, a database we've been using. We collected with David Brady, who is at the Bates Bay, but now he's moving to Riverside. And, uh, and Evelyn and I have an article we published last year on the determinants of overall income distribution. So uh, yeah, you'll become familiar with this later in the semester, the Gini in in Index of Income Inequality. And uh, that's a measure of overall income distribution. Uh, and so. We, we have already analyzed that data before, and so we decided to take a look at what the determinants of top 1% income shares. Were they similar to overall distribution? Some things you wouldn't think so. So for instance, uh, an important determinant of overall household income distribution before taxes and transfers is the proportion of the population in single mother households. So the bigger the growth in single mother households, the more poverty you're going to have, and also the more income inequality. Okay, so let's go back to this. Well, one of the things you can see by looking at this right away is this rise of top income shares is not a universal phenomenon. If we look at that panel there, which is Japan and the continental European countries, that they're not really doing that. There's a little bit of a dip in, up in France. Uh, there's actually a drop in Germany. And, Though, actually, 
overall market income distribution is getting more unequal in, in, in Germany, but it's not because the top 1% is gaining. You can see that. Uh, in the Nordic countries, we have this weird spike. That's because of the change in the, in the Nordic laws, in the Norwegian laws, where they said they increased um, the taxation on capital, no, not on capital gains, on some kind of capital income. So everybody sold off all their shares in uh, something like 2007, and that's why it comes back down. So you really need to look where it ends up. And we can see, yes, it's back to where it was in the 60s, so definitely above where it was in the 80s. But we're talking about looking at, if you look at those four lines, all oh, between 6 and 8% compared to 18.8% um, in the United States. So uh, and we, we hardly see this, this U-shaped pattern, or it's going to be not a U-shaped pattern because the beginning of the U was earlier in the, in the 20th century. Uh, we see some rise here, but really what we're looking at is an Anglo-American phenomenon. And that's what a lot of the, of the critics of Piketty have said, is that he's, the return of capital is stronger the wealth to income ratio is stronger in Europe, in particular in the UK and France, than it is in North America. But that's not where the top 1% have been rising. And so there's, there's, there's a, a slippage in his book. It doesn't, the, 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 um, the argument doesn't quite work. Okay, so. What does work? I'm on. For individual countries. I won't take you through all the complex statistics behind it, but this is, first of all, the overall fit. Our uh, model explains the, change, the changes in the top 1% income really well. And here are the most important factors uh, in this graph. And now we can see right away well, you, don't, you can't, you won't know right away. I'll show you a graph in just a minute. There's, uh, the unionicity has really been declining in most countries except the Nordic countries. And uh, uh, so, first of all, Piketty's right. The reduction of top marginal tax rates, which started uh, with the neoliberal re uh, revolutions in, uh, of Reagan and Thatcher. But most countries still had the pretty high rates that they had during the war. Maybe not quite that high, but they hadn't reduced it much. And that you had really big reductions starting with uh, Thatcher and Reagan. Um, uh, this isn't very, uh, very surprising that stock market capitalization, the bigger stock market capitalization is, the more uh, income is going to be concentrated at the top. Just emerging more wealth. Um, okay. Uh, I want you to, as the Jamaicans say, stick a pin here. That means come back and remember that later. Uh, trade openness is negatively related to top income shares, and so is employment and knowledge intensive services. Okay. All right. You can see that the main pieces of the explanation are really the biggest things are secular center and right government, characteristic of those Anglo-American countries, uh, union centralization, those countries have very decentralized unions, and union density. And that's really what powers the differences between the countries and explains the rise in top income shares. Now, Let's look at what we did not find. Uh, one thing that we were really surprised at is that financial sector size doesn't explain it. We just went, okay, what it is, is especially recently, it's this, you know, the financial sector and the huge amounts of money that all these, um, you know, uh, stock, um, you know, credit default swaps and stuff like that are bringing these managers. Well, we didn't find that. And I don't know, we were still puzzling over why we didn't find this. Because that is really a characteristic of the Anglo-American countries, but especially the United States and, and uh, 
and the UK. They, they really, the big importance of Wall Street for the American economy and the city for the uh, uh, British economy. Okay. Then we tested a bunch of things that uh, was, were suggested by the apologists of the top 1%. In other words, apologists meaning people, economists, who are saying they get that money because they deserve it. They deserve it. And what they're saying, it's the normal operation of, uh, uh, of competitive markets which results in compensation in line with the marginal productivity uh, of the holders of marketable asset, capital or skill. They defend the top incomes of, high man of top managers and entrepreneurs, arguing that globalization and technological change, especially the ICT re revolution, enable, and this is uh, uh, a quote from Kap Kaplan and Rao, they enable, high, quote, highly talented individuals to manage or perform on a larger scale, applying their talents to greater pools of resources and reaching larger number of people and thus receiving higher compensation. They themselves point out that if this argument is correct, we should see top income shares, they should be related to measures of globalization, to measures of technological success, especially in ICT, to economic growth and to export competitiveness, all of those things. Well, we didn't find that. We didn't, we didn't find them relate. In the case of trade openness and knowledge intensive services, they had the opposite effect with the, with which the apologists say. They were negative. It's easy to see why. Because those Nordic economies, which are fairly egalitarian, are very trade open and they have really big knowledge intensive service sectors. I mean, you should know that. Ericsson. Nokia and so on. Um, and economic growth is not related to the rise of top income shares. It should be if the explanation is marginal productivity of these top income earners. Uh, trade surplus, capital openness, all of those are uh, not related at all. Now, let me just show you the graphs of what's perhaps the most important variable. Uh, and that's union density. This is the percent of wage and salary earners that are organized into labor unions. And first of all, you just have to note the, how much higher union density is in the Nordic countries than any other group. Second, it rises till the 90s in the Nordic countries, uh, and then sort of starts to fall, but it's still well above 70% in all those countries. And you can see in every other one of these groups, now the, I can tell you what the secret is here, if we compare these countries to these over here, is that services, including private services, are organized in the Nordic countries. So with the growth of the service sector, you don't get a decline in union density. That's what's going on on continental Europe, is the service, Private services are not organized. So with the expansion of private services, which happens in all these countries, you get declining union density. Or we can put it the other way. Deindustrialization leads to declining union density. Okay. So we see particularly big declines in, you know, Australia. Some of the Anglo-American countries used to have pretty high union density. Ireland. New Zealand and Australia. New Zealand and Australia, that's special cases. Uh, I mentioned that in my lecture the other day. But we can see all of these countries we're going to get uh, fairly large declines in union density. And that's one of the main reasons why we get a concentration of income shares at the top. Okay. That's what I've got to say. I'll take uh, questions.